If you didn't know, I was on a podcast recently called A Couple Thoughts Podcast with a lovely couple, um, and they wanted to talk about social justice and all of the things that I've been talking about a lot online. And so they gave me permission to put this on my YouTube channel, so enjoy. And I wanted to do a video actually responding to some comments of pushback against what was said in this podcast. And I did appreciate the pushback that I got. It seemed to be very well thought out. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to get pushback like that for two reasons. One, I want to make sure that I'm being as clear as I can possibly be. And so if there's anything that's unclear and people are misunderstanding what I say, I want to know about it. And then the other thing is, maybe I'm wrong about what I say. And so I'll respond to a number of, of, of points of pushback on this podcast, but enjoy this. And if you like it, go ahead and uh, get over to iTunes and subscribe to this couple's podcast. It's called A Couple Thoughts, and I hope you enjoy it. I remember thinking to myself, what, what is a white person to do? And I feel so bad for white people because Man. they're kind of, whatever way they go, they, they, they're, they're doing it wrong. Hello, and welcome to A Couple Thoughts. We are a couple... Who have thoughts. Yeah, we do. And then my name... And then my <laughs> name is... And then my name is Chris. And, and also then my name would be Natalie. <laughs> would and, be Natalie. And then it would be Natalie. But in reality, it's... <laughs> And welcome to iTunes. Hey, what up, iTunes? So this is our first episode on iTunes. If you've recently discovered us, then you might be like, what are you guys talking about? Uh, first four episodes were on SoundCloud. But um, because I was trying to figure out how it all works to get on iTunes, and we were trying to just test out if people even want to listen to us. Right. Looks like some people do. Yeah, well, so, people got excited we were going to go on iTunes. They said it's much easier to listen that way. Yeah. So, hey, anything to, you know. So, uh, we did it. Yeah. Episode five, first official one on iTunes. And from now on, we'll be here exclusively on iTunes. How awesome. And what a wonderful episode to have. First one on iTunes. Mm -hmm. But we'll get into that. What are you drinking? Or, hey, what were you drinking? <laughs> so, we previously recorded a special guest that we're going to talk about in a minute. Um and it was very exciting. And while we had that interview with him, I was drinking decaf <laughs> coffee in a Hans Zimmer mug I got when I saw Hans Zimmer live. One of the greatest concerts I've ever seen or heard. It was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. I, too, was drinking decaf in a Stranger Things mug. That tells you several things about us. Here's, here's what this tells you. <laughs> One, we're parents. That's why we're drinking decaf mm -hmm. at whatever it was, like 9.30 at night or whatever. Two, Stranger Things. It's a good show. Good show. Hans Zimmer, awesome. Hans Zimmer's great. So the second thing it tells you is, I was gonna say we're nerds, but I don't think I don't think liking Hans Zimmer's nerdy enough. Stranger Things maybe. I think going to a Hans Zimmer concert is pretty nerdy, and knowing all the songs before they even like start. Like, oh, That's this is true. the Dark Knight theme, or oh, Inception Encore, or That's true. The Wonder Woman kind of theme yeah. and stuff. Oh yeah. Now Stranger Things. I'm sure you got a lot of fans out there. Yeah. I know you're nodding your head like, that's me. That's right. Um, this is for you. I liked season one, but it wasn't until season two when I was like, okay, I'm officially a fan. Yes. Yeah, but I've heard the opposite of, of a few other people. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, I definitely fangirled out by by the time we got to season two. It was, yes, I'm good. on the train. I'm and looking at a poster of ours right now. Chugging away. It's such a cool poster. Anyway, it's a cool mug, too. Yeah, cool mug. <clears throat> Hans Zimmer mug's pretty darn cool. Hans Zimmer <clears throat> does such films as anything Christopher Nolan Almost anything, and um, Lion King, and we already talked about them on our music podcast we did, episode yeah, we four. Guessed, I know. It, I feel like no three. Episode our, three. <laughs> three of our intros have still been about music. It's like okay, we gotta we gotta move on, Chris. Guess what, guys? We like music and, <laughs> and movies. movies and shows and TV shows. Did you know that, guys? <laughs> have you noticed? I'll tell you what. We also like is God. We do He's like pretty God. Cool. He's very cool. And oh, you just turned it spiritual. I, I was did. about to add something else. That oh. <laughs> I just thought. I just wanted to tell the audience something that I did since the last time we did our podcast. Okay, go. Guess what, you guys? If we weren't... Okay. So there's... I think... I forget the difference between dweeb and nerd. But to <clears throat> me, nerd is a compliment, right? Well, my nerdum has officially peaked. 
because oh right i officially played does it count as dungeons and dragons i think it does technically what do you call it was it rpg what is it called role play role playing game right? yeah rpg I, I played an RPG, you guys, which isn't really surprising. I think what's more surprising is that I never had before. Most people are probably more like, wait, you haven't done this before? Mm-hmm. But I did it. I was really tired and I really sucked <laughs> at it. But I'm going to come back with a vengeance and be even better next time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so just... I wore my cloak he did wear that cloak. you made. <laughs> that shows us how nerdy we are. <laughs> um, I came dressed. As my character, my character name was Mad Mardigan. Mm-hmm. If you know where that's <clears throat> from, then you're my new best friend. That's right. Spoiler alert, it's from Willow. <laughs> Amazing movie. My name is Nova Dawn. Directed by Ron Howard. Which Soundtrack is by James Horner. my cheesy <laughs> name that I have used for various nerdy things. Nerdy things. Anyway, yes. I just thought you guys, that just, just have that visual. There we are. In this very room where we make this podcast. The very what, room. The very room. The, the room With, where all the magic happens. And we got recruited by um, a friend of mine named Ben, who is probably going to be a future guest. Yeah. If he ever gets his schedule figured out. And he's a really good DM. He's laughing, he's laughing right now. And if you guys know what a DM is, then. He's a great DM. <laughs> he made his to... own story. We're, he's, he's a writer and he's going to talk about writing. But yeah, it's he made his own story and he's a good DM. He is. And, uh, and a good storyteller. It was really fun. Yeah. And he's probably listening to this and laughing and smiling and Shout stuff. out to Ben. Shout out to Ben. But um but anyway, sorry, I took us on a train. <laughs> it was a good train. It was a good train. But let's get back we'll get back on the other track. Okay. Before we get back on the track. Oh, which track? Okay. Our child is cute. Oh my gosh. Like today? Oh geez. Wow. 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 She's just amazing. She's a, a beautiful, beautiful little being. So beautiful. Mm. She went to the park today. We played with Bubbles. Bubble, Bubble. That's what she says. Yeah. Babu. Babu. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> we could just do a whole podcast on that, and I'm sure everyone would love to hear that. Who wouldn't get bored by that? An hour and a half of us talking about <laughs> our child. You know that's what you guys want to hear. This is why you're here. We could easily fill that hour and a half. <laughs> Sorry, I sound a little um, congested, as you will tell. I will sound very different suddenly <laughs> when we cut to the interview. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't get it get miraculously healed in a matter of seconds. It's just we record on two different days. But anyway, so sorry for the stuffy nose sounding type of thing. <laughs> to all my, my allergy sufferers out there, I'm feeling it. I'm mm-hmm. with you. But. Yeah. yeah. So back to God. Sorry. Yeah. That was a good train. Let's hitch our wagon to that caboose. <laughs> Does that phrase what work? the heck are you talking about? Well, we were going back to God, which is better than... What's the caboose? Well, I I merged trucks and trains <laughs> together and said, hitch my wagon to that caboose. It didn't make sense. It's fine. It didn't work. Uh-uh. It's late. That's true. Continue. Again, it's late. But God anyways, what now? <laughs> so God, back to the issue at hand. Uh, recently we've been thinking about, um, and it's hard not to think about it. All you gotta do is go on Twitter and it's in your face. Jeez, anyway. These, um, social justice issues, if you will, um, pertaining to things like race, um, gender, intersectionality, intersectionality that's going to be another podcast for another day <clears throat> and etc this sort of social justice narrative that we're seeing everywhere um being talked about mm-hmm. so recently we've seen it kind of entering the church and even in leadership in kind of a concerning way to us like hey of course social issues in general are important and christians need to be involved but mm-hmm. there's certain verbiage and what do you mean by that sort of things that we need to think about and talk about yeah and clarify because we believe that social justice is very different than biblical justice um it's all about terminology here i think yeah of course christians need to be involved in social justice but we have to really define what that means and it has to be biblically based not emotionally or 
politically or any, anything like that. And we're seeing the not the negative effects of it happening in the church and in relationships between um, Christians. So anyways, with all this in mind, um, is uh, our special guest has lots of thoughts and feelings on it, but I'll let Natalie tell you um, how she found him and why we got him on this particular podcast. I'm sure many of you have heard of the uh, MLK 50 conference and the ERLC conference. I might have that acronym wrong. A really, really good friend of mine who I love was listening to them, so I wanted to listen to them. But I found after listening to uh, just a few of the speakers, I, 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 I mean, honestly, I didn't listen to every speaker, so um, I can't tell you what every single person said, but I listened to three of them. And um, I felt a little more confused, I think, than I did before. And and I was hoping for clarity because once I discovered that it was talking a lot about, about like, the social justice warrior things, I thought, well, at least I'll have a better understanding. And I didn't. I was – it definitely felt more divisive. It felt – more confusing. Mm-hmm. So it was like I they went to, to find use a lot of phrases that sound really great and have a lot of the same words. But once the sentence is over, you're like, what did you just say? Yeah. Well, I don't bef- understand. Before that, I remember when we've talked about it, mm-hmm. the social justice issues, it's like, OK, I feel like there's uh, we're we're screaming for a lot of different changes and things we're wanting. But and we're being told a lot of ways we're supposed to feel. But then I've also noticed that there hasn't been a lot of suggestions on what we're actually supposed to do. So I thought, okay, That's well, yeah. well, this conference will hopefully clarify, well, what, what can we do? Um, of course, first we need to clarify, like, okay, what is the issue? Is this something that is really happening? Do we really need to be worrying about um, a lot of the, I guess, the the racial tensions and the reconciliations and the... I can't remember the other <laughs> Asians. Um, but at, when you first hear reparations about... Reparations is Reparations another is another one. <laughs> um, so at first I went as a... as a Chris is Hispanic. I'm a white girl, in case you're finding us for the first time and you don't know based on our voices. <laughs> so I'm a white chick. Hola, como estas? <laughs> Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> My white girl voice. I'm a white girl pretending to do a white girl voice. What does that say about me? <laughs> Uh, You're totally okay. culturally appropriating. I'm from Southern California, man. Come on. California. California. Anyway, here we go again. We're not going to get back into that. Um, all that to say, <clears throat> it definitely made me feel more... Oh, I don't even know how to explain it. Here's what it made me feel like I needed to do. I wanted to find my African-American brothers and sisters, and I wanted to just talk. I was like, I need to talk, to, I need to talk about what's being said here, because a lot of what was being said in the conference, I, I personally do not think was helpful. I do think it was divisive. And I, I haven't personally seen the issues they're talking about actually happening. Um, I'm sure, th- like, okay, let me, okay, this is what we need to say first. There are still racists and there are still prejudiced people. That is not at all what this debate is at all. I'm talking about white evangelical churches as a whole, are they racist? The simple answer, according to some of the speakers at the conference, is yes. I mean, honestly, Mm -hmm. if I'm on, if if they just were given a yes or no (laughs) on that, I think they'd have to say yes. That's what I'm saying I don't think is happening. I don't think there's widespread, right, sorry, widespread racist churches as Mm -hmm. a whole. Are there some out there? Probably. But I don't think this is a widespread issue. So anyway, that's that's the broad, broad one I'm saying. So on my search, um, I just wanted someone to respond to this kind of kind of it was anyone else talking about what was being said at the conference, you know, almost like I need to debrief with someone. (laughs) So I found Daryl Harrison, who's awesome. um, And their podcast is great, but we talk about that later. But who I found and was really excited to find was Adam Robles. I found him on YouTube, and he was actually would do responses to the the talks at the MLK 50 and the ERLC conference. And he also just talked about um, the social justice warriors and social justice and biblical justice. And he just um, 
was very eloquent. He was very gracious. I thought um, he smart, smart, very smart. knows knows his word, mm-hmm. and um, I, his videos just really kind of helped me and Chris as we were processing these things and listening to um, what's being said mm-hmm. on this issue. So uh, I reached out to him on Facebook and asked if he would want to be a guest on our podcast and he agreed and we were really excited about that. Um, I was really glad to find him. He talks about this stuff way better than we can. <laughs> so we thought, hey, we want, we've want we been thinking about this, it's been on our minds, but mm-hmm. <laughs> let's just get him to come talk about it because he talks about it way better than we do. That's very <laughs> He's true. He's much more eloquent than we are. <laughs> <laughs> he has, he makes a lot of good points. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's one of those people where, you know, you're listening to him or are you reading something about somebody and then you're like, yes, those are the words I was looking to say. Or like, those are my feelings. I agree with that. But now I know how to say it. Yeah, he said or now it so you're much saying better. <laughs> really well, you know. So instead of us having a podcast of us bumbling through as I'm, as I'm bumbling right now. <laughs> Uh, we bring someone else. We bumble who, through the interview too, but likely he makes a lot of yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah, we bumble through the interview. We, you'll see us. Yeah, anyways, you'll hear us. See, I can't even talk. So, you'll without hear further ado, let's get to Adam Robles and the interview we had with him. And uh, we'll check back with you guys right after that. Enjoy. Cue transition sound. <laughs> So, with no further ado, here's Adam Robles. We're very excited and honored to have you, so thank you so much for taking time to talk to us. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Sure. So, we just wanted to start off with just a brief, like, tell us a little bit about yourself so our audience can get to know you a bit, and also what uh, what made you decide to start a YouTube channel? <laughs> yeah, well, I am an elder in a very small church in Vermont. Um, and I moved to Vermont probably about, I don't know, man, how many years ago? Probably four years ago, four or five years ago, uh, from New York City. I lived there for a while as well. Oh, sweet. And, um, yeah, yeah, it, it was, it was pretty awesome. And then, um, what, what got me into YouTube is really this, the issue that we're going to probably talk about today. I've been kind of looking into it since Donald Trump was elected president. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't really think about making a YouTube. I was kind of looking at it from a secular perspective, if that makes sense. Um, and yeah. I was kind of checking out sort of what what the world was saying about Trump's election, you know, and, and all of that. And then I didn't really want to make a YouTube channel until I started realizing that this was also in the church. And so that's that's the whole reason I started the YouTube channel, and that's why I'm still doing it. Awesome. Well, that that answered my next one because I was going to ask how you got into the topic, but that was perfect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, us who are in the church, it's it's been on our minds. It's been on Chris and I's minds. It's been coming up a whole lot more in conversation with you know with friends, um, on online you know comments and different things. You kind of can spark conversations on there too. So, like you said, I think I we saw it already happening it, from a secular perspective, but hearing it a whole lot more now in the church. It's something we thought, hey, you know, let's let's tackle this. Okay, so pertaining to social justice, uh, or as let's say the media is saying those issues are, do you think these are issues that the church should be worried about? Uh, yeah, a- absolutely. I-, I think that um, it's very clear that th- this is important um, in sort of the general conversation in, in-, in our culture in general. And so, you know, any, any issue that's, that's kind of important in general in our world, we, we need to at least have some kind of a biblical answer for. So, so yes, I, I do think that these are issues that, that the church should be thinking about and addressing. Um, but we need to be addressing them from a very distinctly Christian biblical foundation. Excellent. So what would you say the difference between biblical and social justice is? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, and this is, this is it kind of gets a little dicey here because um, I, I think that sometimes people use these terms, you know, kind of in a kind of squishy way where you can't really pin down what they mean. Uh, but I'll say what I mean when I mean social justice. What, what I mean is sort of this idea that there are, you know, really like two basic classes in society, and we've got sort of the overclass, which is the 
oppressor class, essentially. And then we've got the underclass, which is sort of the victim class. It's sort of a narrative that you see, you know, that, that all over the place. So, you know, we've got, you know, oppressors, which in, in, our, in our society, which are the males. And then we've got the victim class, which is the females. We've got the oppressors, which are the white people. And then we've got the oppressed, or the victims, rather, that are the people of color. Mm-hmm. Um, the oppressors are the rich, the victims are the poor. So you see this kind of playing itself out in a variety of different ways. And I, that's what I call this so, sort of social justice narrative. And biblical justice is very different. B- biblical justice uh, says that, you know, you, you don't have partiality to the rich or the poor. Mm-hmm. In fact, there's a there's a verse that I really love because, um, you know, God, 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 God is smart. You know, he's, he, he mm-hmm. knew what to, what to say in the Bible. Right. And so <laughs> yeah. there's, there's a, there's a there's a verse in uh, Exodus that says, "Don't follow the crowd in doing wrong." He says, "When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. Do not show hmm. favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit." Hmm. And then later later he says uh, that that you sh- don't show partiality to the poor, but also don't show favoritism to the great. And you think, well, well, why would somebody show favoritism to the great? Well, obviously, you know, if somebody is rich and they have influence and they're they're powerful, you could see why someone might show favoritism to someone like that because you know they can kind of get position and power as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But 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 you'd ask, why would somebody be show favoritism to the poor? They have no influence. They have no power. You know, God's smart. He he knows that hmm. that 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 this victim class potentially could could potentially be a source of power. And I think we see that in our politics today. So, so that's what I, 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 when I say social justice, that's what I'm talking about. And when I say biblical justice, I'm talking about very clear biblical commandments, hmm. the 10 commandments, essentially. Yeah. Very cool. I didn't really think about it that way, but the victim class being something God had already thought about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. do, do you I, I see thought this? that was interesting too. Sorry to interrupt you, but I yeah. thought that was interesting too because this this is you know this is straight out of Leviticus. Like this is old school stuff. Yeah. And it's like, well, why would somebody show favoritism to the poor in in like the, in old school Bible times? Hmm. Well, it's the same situation as what's going on today. There's there's nothing new under the sun, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So are you <laughs> seeing this sort of uh, victim mentality starting to creep into the church more and more? <clears throat> yeah, you know. Uh, I don't. I don't want to pretend like I'm a, a historian. I, I don't know yeah. when it started, but but yeah. I mean, I, I've started to certainly notice it more and more recently. So um, yeah. yeah, where yeah yeah where where there's sort of this, you know, kind of th- there there's there's two there's two groups and there, there's one group that's sort of you know oppressing the other and and you're like, well, how do you prove that? Well, they don't really know. It's just sort of like, well, obviously there's. <laughs> There's majority, there's majority one group and minority the other. So obviously right. there's oppression. Yeah, and, you know, that's 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 a problematic in my opinion. Oh yeah, I wondered too. Is I think a lot of the language around the social justice movement are things like, well, justice, <laughs> and then you hear words like, yeah, yeah. you know, righteous, standing up for the oppressed. These sound like biblical concepts. So to me. No wonder I think that the church is almost maybe a little too quickly before taking a step back and asking, you know, almost what you said, like, what, well, what exactly does this mean? Like, what are you asking for? And as Chris and I talked about this, I think we, you know, you can get discouraged listening to some of the talks at the, the MLK 50 and stuff, just thinking, I'm hearing a lot of, I guess, maybe some of the accusations, but I haven't quite heard the answer. What, what exactly is being asked of us to do? Maybe, maybe, I guess the white evangelicals in general, <laughs> what, what is it that you, you know, you want us to do? But I've, I've wondered if maybe that's one reason that the church for one has kind of felt like, oh, I guess we need to maybe jump on the wagon, as you could say, because it, in the language, it almost does sound like a righteous movement. Yeah, it does. I, I think um, there's definitely sort of a certain kind of language like you said, that that just sounds really nice. I mean, it sounds <laughs> it sounds like loving, and it sounds you know you know just nice, really. And yeah. and, and and I think that it, here's this is just my opinion. I, I I can't prove this, and I don't I don't want to say I know people's hearts, but mm-hmm. but I do think that that sometimes Christians have sort of a, a little bit of a fatigue of being on sort of the the side of every issue that doesn't sound very loving. Yeah. And, and what I mean by what I mean by that is like in, in the culture, you know. 
you know, we, we, we know the Bible has very clear sexual ethics and things like that. Mm -hmm. And in the culture, it, it sounds unloving to say to a homosexual, Hey, you can't, you can't be with, with your partner. You can't marry your partner. Mm -hmm. Like that sounds so unloving. And, and, you know, nobody wants to sound like that. I I get, I get that. Yeah. And, you know, and there's so, so many issues like that where we kind of have to be ogres. Like, we, at least that's how <laughs> yeah, we that's feel a, like it. That's a really good point. I mean, I can see that how a lot of Christians can finally yeah. be like, oh, finally we can, you know, band together <laughs> with the world and we can, then won't be looked down upon. We can arm in arm and yeah, but they, but they forget, they you know. That, I don't think they think of it that way, but, but, but they think of it like, you know, like, okay, this is an issue of justice that, yeah. that we're all on board with, we can all agree on. And in a certain way, they're right. I, I, I do think that we, we all want to stand together against racism, but, yeah. but you know, we have to define that you know, very you know, carefully and biblically because you know, one, one example I like to use because it's, it's such a, a clear example is you know, everyone says, well, we're all against murder. And like, well, not really because we all define murder very differently. So mm. yeah, you know, we, can, we can team up with the world in some ways when they're saying they're against some murders, but like, let's not pretend like we all define that word the same. We don't, right? you know? And so I don't know. That's just an opinion of mine. I don't know if that's really the case, but I think that's part of it, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I've heard some people talk about white guilt in a sense (laughs) where um, they'll even say like in the Bible, the, um, the sons that were taking the sins of the fathers and like so now we we as white people on the way obviously but <laughs> as a white person would say we as white people have to repent for the sins of our ancestors in order to bring reconciliation of the races and then they you know they quote the bible in certain ways where it sounds like even to me i'm like huh that does kind of make sense but sure. um i saw a video of yours talking about this can you go into that a little bit your, your thoughts on that yeah, no, I, I definitely can. And and so one thing that, that I think is is helpful is that th- there is a certain kind of guilt that 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 a culture or a society kind of has communally. And I, I think that that's a real concept. Um, but the, but the, but the problem is that that guilt is not something that we can sort of uh, deal with, like with restitution, like in a in a, in a criminal or civil case um that kind of a guilt so like the societal guilt the communal guilt that we all have for certain sins that's something that god holds us accountable for so um so a good example of that would be you know in in acts when when paul uh peter rather says that that all of the uh all of israel is 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 essentially guilty for 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 crucifying christ Hmm. and he's right about that but you couldn't then go and say, okay, and therefore we're going to go to the judge and you're all going to get the penalty for, for murder. Like that, that would, it doesn't work that way. So when it comes to like what we do, like with each other, um, it, there's, there's no like guilt that you can get because of the sins of your fathers. But when it comes to God, he does have sort of a generational sort of curse that he does give to certain societies for their sins. Like he does in the old Testament with, you know, some of the sins, of the, of the people of Israel, you know, mm-hmm. bowing down to Baal and stuff like that. That's different. That That's that's before God, not really sort of a, you know, person-to-person civil type thing. Mm-hmm. So, so like, if it came to, like, a restitution, like, some people talk about reparations or things like that, uh, that wouldn't be biblical. Uh, but there is sort of a communal guilt that is real uh, that we should, we should acknowledge. Mm-hmm. But it's not something that we, you know, we would deal with, you know, kind of judicially right now, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like we couldn't deal with it really in this lifetime. It's kind of only God's job to judge it almost well, y- in his yeah, timeline. Sort of, right. But we could deal with it in this lifetime, but it, it's not going to look like, like, like the social justice people want it to. So um, the way that we, we deal with it in this lifetime is, you know, f- forgiveness <laughs> and <laughs> reconciliation and stuff like that. So, so just, you know, just, I mean, it sounds kind of like basic and stupid, but yeah. But that is how we deal with it now. You know, we, we, you know, we don't have any, there's no biblical recourse to sort of say, okay, well, your grandfather did this to my grandfather. Therefore you owe me. There's nothing like that. Right. 
what I always say to people who talk about things like reparations is like, all right, well, well, do I owe myself money? Like, I don't understand. Like, I'm, <laughs> you know, I, I'm pretty sure that my ancestors were enslaved, and I'm pretty sure that other ancestors of mine enslaved them. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, <laughs> my dude, you have to pay yourself. <laughs> right. Exactly. I, I don't know. It's just it's just kind of silly, but um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, that's why God's law doesn't address that stuff. It, it'd just be too silly. Yeah. 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 I remember when we were younger, we would do things like come together and pray and repent like as a group for past sins of generations prior and then you know fast forward 10 20 years later and like you're in another service and they want to do the same thing and you're thinking but i already did that like let's do it again like when does it end yeah when 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 is it done when do we like okay we're we're all forgiven we're all moved on now can we like move on but it seems like it just keeps coming up we're like how many times like how many times do we have to do this for it to be yeah. over? Well, I think when we were well, younger too, we didn't we didn't necessarily understand what it meant, and uh, and then we were listening to Daryl Harrison, who I think I saw we had a, a common Facebook friend was <laughs> Daryl Harrison, and I was like, that's cool, and he talks about the sin by proxy and and forgiveness by proxy, and I thought, oh, I wish I had I had heard of that back then to maybe you know kind of help us understand exactly what what sins we can repent for and which ones we can't. That, that's a great point. And actually, to, to me, to answer one of your questions is, you know, wh- where does this end? Well, it doesn't end. That's 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 the point. It never ends. Mm-hmm. And there's always going to be someone that has some ethnic background doing some kind of sin to someone from another ethnic background. And so if you had to repent of that every single time, that would never end. And right. there would be never ending strife and never ending conflict. Mm. And unfortunately, a lot of where this stuff is foundationally you know, develop these ideas of the oppressor class and the victim class. Um, it, you know, that's what they want. They, they actually want never ending conflict. That's the whole point of the ideology. Hmm. And I know that this is a touchy thing and people don't like when you use this word, but, but foundationally, a lot of these ideas are, are Marxist ideas. It's just that simple. And so if the whole idea of Marxism is to cause chaos. Mm-hmm. And so, and, and in that way to change the social order all the way from the foundations to the top. And that's the point. And so, um, yeah, to answer your question, you know, Chris, it doesn't end. Mm-hmm. It, it just never ends. That's the mm-hmm. point. Yeah, and I then heard, as far as, go ahead. I was going to say, I heard you um, just today actually talk about cultural Marxism and how yeah. people didn't want you to use that word. <laughs> uh, can you just explain real fast to our listeners what cultural Marxism is and why, let's say, other people don't like you to use that term? <laughs> well, I have some opinions on that, but but what I'll, what I'll say is that what I have what what I'll say is this that so so cultural Marxism there, there's a lot of interesting stuff on YouTube about that mm-hmm. uh, that concept and some of it's good and some of it's not, but basically all it means is it's it's a it's an application of of Karl Marx's uh, I, uh, ideology philosophy, um, it's an application of his philosophy to different areas in cultural areas. So uh, Marx's philosophy is, is more about economics and about, uh, and about like economic classes and things yeah. like that. Um, and, and it, that, that still definitely applies today to a lot of these people, but, but not, not all of people would agree with, with, with Marx's, you know, economic policy, but other things. And so this idea of the oppressor class and the victim class, that's straight out of Karl Marx's idea. You know, basically, the, the, the poor people were the victims, and the rich people, the people who own stuff, were the oppressors. And so that was the whole that was the whole kind of you know concept that he had. And so, so cultural Marxism is just a, a way of saying you're applying Karl Marx's ideas to different areas besides economics. Hmm. Um, anyway, and so people don't like that because because you know they. And, and here's why I think they don't like it: they don't, they're not self consciously Marxist. So a lot right. of these people, they wouldn't say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a Marxist, no mm-hmm. problem. Yeah. Like, like nobody would – well, I'm not going to say nobody. <laughs> but most people wouldn't say that. Yeah, yeah. But um, that doesn't change the fact that a lot of the foundations of the ideas that they you know, express do come from that tradition. Um, and so people get really frustrated because they're like, well, I'm not a Marxist. I've, I've never even read Karl Marx. Like mm-hmm. that might be true, <laughs> but um, – <laughs> It doesn't change the fact that that's where the ideas come from. And so I, I can understand being frustrated about that, um, but it doesn't make it not true. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like before how I was raised was, and, I, and I'm from Southern California, so maybe it was easier to do where every it, it was like every race was together. I had friends of all different colors, nationalities, whatever. 
But now saying that I didn't notice skin color is now a racist thing to say. So whereas before it was like friendships happened so much more naturally, it's almost like now we're hyper aware of I'm a white girl, you're a black girl, you're a Hispanic girl, where it never, it's it's almost like the opposite effect of what I think we're wanting to happen is what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then you, yeah, you, you just start playing funny mind games like, mm-hmm. um, oh no, am I, am I talking to this black person just so they think I like them, but I, I actually <laughs> do like them. And yeah. so like, now yeah. what do I do? Yeah. And it just seems like it's causing these, these extra things that I don't think were there before as a result of almost shining this, this light on this issue in this way. Yeah. I, I, I yeah that, that's that's very interesting that you say that well, what, one of the very first videos I did like probably like maybe like maybe like my sixth or seventh video that I ever did I still had like a really bad mic and a bad camera so like <laughs> this wasn't this wasn't like the greatest video but but I thought the content was really good I, I reviewed an article uh, from nine marks which I which I like so don't don't hear me saying that I don't like nine marks dot uh, com I like it but but this article was really bad and, and it was talking about why white churches are hard for black people. And I remember in two consecutive paragraphs, like like two sentences apart, this guy says, this pastor, he says, uh, white churches are hard for black people because when you have, um, when, you, when you're friends with a white person as a black man, like you, you if they call you their black friend, then, then you're, 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 you're like, it's like a tokenism, like you're their token black friend. Yeah. Right. But, but and then the very next paragraph, two sentences later, he says, "White churches are hard for black people because you know we don't want to be just your friend. That's colorblindness. That's ignorance." <laughs> and, and, I'm, wow. and I'm like, exactly. and I, I remember thinking to myself, "What what is a white person to do?" Like I feel so bad for white people Man. because they're Me too. kind of whatever way they go, they, they there's they're doing it wrong. So it's either your black friend, well that's tokenism, or it's just my friend, and it's like, well you're ignoring my ethnicity. Right. Yeah. And, and, and look, look, look. The, the reality is, mo- I, I'm willing to say that most run of the mill people aren't thinking in these terms. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. But unfortunately, there's a lot of very vocal people that insist on thinking in these terms, and it's very difficult. And and I agree with you, um, Natalie, that it's 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 very divisive. It wasn't always like this. Right. I, I don't remember going to churches um, and ever really thinking about this stuff. And and, and I'll. Um, I know that when I tell people that, sometimes they say, well, yeah, it's just because you're white privileged. Well, <laughs> I'm not white. You know what I mean? Like, I don't even know what you're talking about. But the, exactly. but the point is, like, this is also, it hasn't always been this way, and it certainly seems to be coming, be becoming more this way, and that's that's yeah. troubling to me. And, and mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't think that's that surprising when we're kind of using these categories that come from cultural Marxism. You know what I mean? That's the well, point yeah. of this. Yeah. Well, I, one thing I was going to read to you, actually, and get your opinion on kind of goes with this. Okay. Um, so a friend of mine <clears throat> posted on Facebook a few months ago. She's a good friend of mine. She's a leader in her church. Uh, she says this. I'd like to hear from some of my non-white friends about this topic. Would you attend? <laughs> would you attend a majority white church? Why or why not? What can majority white churches do better to be a safe place for non-white congreg- congregants? And then she has a disclaimer. I do not want comments from my white friends on this post. I hear from y'all a lot, and I really like to learn something new. To be honest, if I did see that on my Facebook uh, wall, I would not respond. But, <laughs> but I will say this: I, I, I would say that probably for starters, if it was for me, th- the first thing that you should do is not ask questions like that, because um, I, I don't want to be in a church that's that sort of willing to be divisive in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think I think the question is 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 flawed from the start because it assumes that. White churches are not a safe space for uh, people of color, right? So right. The, the very question itself, if you answer it, you're kind of admitting that white churches aren't safe mm-hmm. uh, for, for these people. And, and, and I just don't think that that in, is the case in general. I, I would not say that it's always not the case because I'm sure that there are some churches out there. In fact, I had a phone call with a guy who told me about a church that he went to, and I, I believe him. I, I believe this is true. That was – um, you know, very, you know, it, let's just be honest, but prejudice towards him, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. For, mm-hmm. As a black man. And I, I believe him. I believe that that exists. I yeah. believe that's actually a real thing. Yeah. But I just don't, I just don't believe that it's a rampant problem. So, and I um, definitely don't think it is in her church. I mean, we went to her church for many years and 
it's a great church. Yeah. I yeah. think, in my opinion, I think it's just because her church is in a very white area of the country. Yeah. It, and right. she just feels, maybe, maybe, I don't know, but maybe she just feels like, oh, no, there's not enough black people here. What are we doing wrong? When all it that's is is just a demographic thing. Well, 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 that's exactly it. Because because here's the thing, and and and, and the, you're exactly right. By the way, that that is what she's thinking. She's thinking, wow, our demographics are not um, proportionally wh- where they should be. Whatever that means, I don't mm-hmm. know what that means. But but in her opinion, they aren't. And so there must be some kind of prejudice or racism. Because if there wasn't, then the demographics would be different. That is a cultural Marxist idea. It says mm-hmm. that there should be this proportional representation, and it kind of eliminates any other factors like, you know, maybe, you know, you're just in a white area or maybe yeah. there's other reasons why black people aren't coming that has nothing to do with how safe your space is. Like th- it could be a lots of different things, but the assumption is there's some kind of prejudice, there's some kind of oppression. It has to be. Um, and I just don't think that that's the case in, in most instances. And um, it, it, I mean, that's, that's a, you know, un- until she kind of has different assumptions and different presuppositions mm-hmm. about things, she's never going to be satisfied uh, until, I mean, because because think about it, what is the right proportion? Right. I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh-huh. I don't know the answer to that. I've asked that question a bunch and I, I've never gotten the answer to it. So because there is no answer, that, that's why I've never gotten an answer. Hmm. But yeah, that, that, I, I don't know. I mean, it's just a. Uh, it, the, the whole question is kind of framed incorrectly, I think. Yeah, and, and when she talks about, uh, would you attend a majority white church, why or why not? That just kind of feels like if someone that isn't white wouldn't attend a majority white church, you'd think for any reason that'd be kind of racist, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I guess I, I'm trying to think of, of a good reason. I, I can't think of a good reason. Um, I mean, if the gospel is there and, and you know, <laughs> right. and you're learning to like, which is another, actually, it's a great um, transition. So one thing, another video I heard of yours, you talked about the subject of how people that aren't white were talking about how they felt they didn't have this um, feeling of camaraderie, of unity, because they didn't have people of their own race in their church. And then you kind of went to the point of how our Christianity should be almost more important than our race. That Christianity identity should be more important than that. Can you explain that more? Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, it, I think our, 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 our identity in Christ is absolutely more important uh, and should be, should be you know, more foundational than our ethnic makeup. I, I, let, me, let me say this. I, you know, I, I'm Puerto Rican, and I like being Puerto Rican. Um, I like my family. I love our culture. I love the food. I love everything about being Puerto Rican, right? So, um, and, and I and I enjoy spending time with with other Puerto Ricans. I, I have no problem with that at all. And I think that that's there's everything good about enjoying different cultures, right? Um, that being said, um, you know, we call each other in in the, in the church. We call each other brothers and sisters for for a reason because. That is a very deep uh, bond that we have mm-hmm. with each other, mm-hmm. um, and you know, lots of people will say that you know the church is so amazing because it brings people together that normally in the world wouldn't come together. Like there are people in my own church, we right. have a small church, but there are people in my own church that I, I, I wouldn't have been friends with before I became a Christian. Right, it's yeah. just they're not my kind of people. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? <laughs> but. They become your kind of people, like like I mean, my own my own blood brother, like you know, my, my actual brother um, from the same mom and dad. You know, like we're really close, and uh, even though you know there might be things about him that I don't like or that we butt heads, you know, we, we still are super close because that's just how God created this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so yeah, our identity in Christ. I mean, this is a this is a verse that I don't know how this is. Under, uh, up for debate, but it's it, lately it's under debate. Where Paul says in Colossians three, he says, "Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, mm-hmm. barbarian and Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all." Mm-hmm. And that is so that is so important and profound. Like Paul, again, God was smart when he wrote the Bible. <laughs> you know what I mean? He was smart because he knows that these ethnic tensions have a tendency yeah, yeah. of of, 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 of bringing people apart. And so he's like, look, 
I, you know, I created all these ethnicities. This is all good. The diversity is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I love that. That was all my idea. But at the same time, when you're when you're at the table, when you're in communion with the church, all that stuff it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. There's even other sections of the Bible where where he says that that um, that if you're going to follow Christ, if you're going to love Christ, like you know, you're going to hate your mother, you're going to hate your children, mm-hmm. like. In comparison to your 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 love for Christ and your unity in Christ, everything else looks like hate. Yeah, and that's 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 hard. I mean, you guys are parents, right? Like that's hard <laughs> for me to that's hard for me to understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, because I, I have two sons myself, and I just don't understand how how it would be that like I love I, I have to love Christ that much more than I love my 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 own children. Um, but it's the reality. I mean, he says it. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And so. Um, <laughs> You know that's that's not my idea. That's that's God's idea. So um, this unity I have with with um, my brothers in Christ, you know, in the within the church, it's got to. If it's not more foundational than your skin color and your ethnicity, and that's that's something you need to go to God with. That's something I'm mm-hmm. not saying that that's easy to, to deal with. I'm not saying that you know, just get over it. You know, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that's something that you really need to take a good look in the mirror and and ask God why is that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's good. That's a good challenge too. <laughs> you yeah. had to bring my well, kid into it. That's a good challenge it. for me too. I'm, <laughs> I'm preaching to myself, you know. I know, right? I, like as soon as you said, like more than your kid, I'm like, oh my gosh. Talking with others in the church about this, and and it's kind of interesting you brought that up because I, I we've kind of had this challenge with a lot of areas because um, our whole podcast we kind of bring up you know topics that are that are usually kind of at the forefront what people are debating and talking about w- within the church as well. So I think sometimes we could be accused of like trying to ruffle feathers. And for us, it's more like we want to get to the to the root of the issues. And for one, also just learn how to d- discuss the issues well with one another. Yeah. Um, so but so sometimes we get uh, like when, you know, we talk about these things or, or they become important to us. You kind of get this backlash of just you guys, you're not you're not you're not just listening. You're not just trying to to understand the other side point of view. Now with this particular issue, I, I did because it's, it matters to, I always say it, it matters to people who matter to me. So I did want to be, I did actually tread in more lightly than maybe I'm more prone to where I just be like, eh, no. So I did, you know, like I said earlier, tried to see this from every angle, but it, I think in one of your videos, you you did talk about how the the narrative is more you like listen. You need to listen to your brothers and sisters. You need to listen to your brothers and sisters of of color. But yeah. what they really mean is is listen and believe. Could you talk a little bit more about how about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, and and that, that's an accusation that I've people have levied against me before, and, and even actually, especially before I did my YouTube channel, like. I would talk about this stuff with people in person and online, and uh, oftentimes what, what I would get in response to my challenges is, "Hey, you know, you just I, I believe my brothers and sisters in Christ. I believe my black and and brown brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you, you know, and, and I've also heard that you know, hey, if you don't believe them, that's kind of a form of race, racism in itself. And, and and my response to that is is interesting because, um. Well, I think it's interesting anyway. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but but the thing is, like, I actually agree with them. Like, you, you should listen, and yeah. you should take people seriously. So, um, you know, if somebody tells you that they experienced racism, uh, and you're a white person, um, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with believing them. I, you know, like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't assume everyone that says something to me is lying. In fact, I assume, uh, at least I try to assume that they're telling the truth. Exactly. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, there's everything good about that, mm-hmm. and, and I, I, I want to acknowledge that because I, I, I don't think there's that many people out there that just completely disregard uh, black people when they say that there's racism out there. But maybe there might be some. So if there are some listening, don't do that. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> but all that being said, um, that does not mean that we just listen to people and then go ahead and execute justice based on what they've told us. So in other words, if somebody tells us that something happened, we can't then just assume that they're 100% correct and then go do something about it. Because the Bible tells us that in order to in order to admit a charge against an elder or even in, in the criminal situation, you need to have two or more witnesses. And the Proverbs 
you know, which is the, the book of Proverbs is really just an application of, of the Ten Commandments, essentially, in, in different situations. The Proverbs tells us that the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. And so the point is, if, if we're going to go and say, OK, well, um, we're going to take everyone's testimony about this institutional racism or whatever it is, the church is racist or whatever, and we're going to do something about it, you have to actually prove it first. We have to actually confirm that these things are true. And mm-hmm. lately, we've actually been gifted some cool examples of this because uh, there, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but there's been a video released where this woman was pulled over by a police officer and she did a, a Facebook Live video after she was pulled over saying how it was a racist encounter and saying how hmm. the cops threatened her and things like that. And so the, the, the police station got enough inquiries about it because obviously people were really upset about it mm-hmm. that they just released the, the officer's you know camera footage of what happened, the whole <laughs> nice. thing. Yeah. And of course, the, the, I mean, I, I shouldn't say of course, but, but <laughs> the, the police officer was polite, did not threaten her in any way, was pulling her over because she was going 15 miles over the speed limit, you know, things like that. Mm-hmm. And so like, like, okay, that does not mean that sometimes people aren't racially profiled. It does not mean that sometimes people aren't threatened, but this time it wasn't right. Yeah. So that's yeah. why we have to, before we, before we ruin these officers lives, before we, you know, ruin these people's lives, let's verify it first. And that's a biblical yeah. thing. That's not my standard. That's a biblical standard. So uh, the Bible says, you know, you don't listen and believe when it comes to actually doing something about a crime or, mm-hmm. or an injustice. Right. And that's what's always annoying about these clickbait videos and headlines. Cause it's like, yeah. I'm sure there's actual real times that it happens out there. Of course. And like we need we need to deal with those and not have this mess of just fake ones here and there just to get your yeah. clicks, you know? It's like get rid of all those and then we can actually deal with the actual racism and actual <laughs> oppression that we can help, you know, them instead you're of just so, you're so right. Through all this. You're so right. And the and the problem is when you cry wolf so many times and you never prove it, then, like, the, when it really does happen, people are going to be like, oh, I don't care because it's probably fake anyway. Exactly. Like, th- this is this is the problem because there is actually racism out there. Yeah. And all of this stuff, it gives cover to those people. You know uh-huh, what I mean? Uh-huh. Yeah. Along those lines of, you know, we when we say to each other, like, you you know, if a person of color says to me, like, you can't you can't understand, you've never been in my mm-hmm. shoes, I would, I would 100% agree and say that I can't. I, I can't understand what it's like to be a person of color, but it. But I feel like we're never asking the other side. Like, well, I can't know sure. exactly what it's like to be Hispanic or Puerto Rican, or you know. But you might not understand what it's like maybe to to be white. So it's like it's got to be more than than just that. And also that we sometimes we need each other's different perspective to help us come yes. together. Not not for it to be the thing that that puts a block between us almost. And Someone was saying, made a good point, uh, maybe you can elaborate yep. on it too, about, you know, with the, with the victim mentality, how we can sometimes push people away because we don't think they'll understand us. And it could be true. Maybe they haven't gone through the same types of issues that we have. But sometimes you almost need someone with that different perspective to help get you out of it or to help bring you to a different place instead of just surrounding ourselves with a bunch of people who've suffered the same thing. No, that's that's right on. I I, I completely agree with that, and, and I think um, you know that that whole idea of like you know you you won't understand because you, you've never gone through, you know what I've gone through. Like that that honestly that's that's it's a little bit of a of a selfish idea because you know first of all like nobody understands what it's like to be anybody exactly. obviously, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that they're not there's not wisdom to be had from someone else or uh-huh. you know and, and, and you know honestly like I, I think that it really sort of discounts what what God does in the church and, and, and let me let me t- give you a little bit more insight into sort of why I even got into this the, mm-hmm. one of the very first things that I read that I was just like oh what is this was um was a article by Jamar Tisby um, and he runs the website uh, the Black Collective. Anyway, uh, it was the day the day after Trump got elected, and um, maybe it wasn't the day after, but it was right after he got elected. And basically, he he makes the argument in his well, not the argument, but he, he states in this article that he was he didn't feel safe uh, worshiping in his church the Sunday after Trump got elected. Hmm. Um, 
because his, I guess he went to a predominantly white church. So he didn't feel safe with uh, all of these white people that, in his opinion, voted for Trump. Um, wow. And, and <laughs> yeah, I, that's what I said. <laughs> and, and, so, like, wow. and so to me, it's like, you know, who, who's in charge here? Like God or you? Like God has you in this church. And presumably you're not saying they're, they're unbelievers. Maybe he was saying that. I don't know. But, but presumably you're not saying that. And so uh, what, what exactly are you saying that, that these people are, are like potentially, you know, going to beat you up? Like what, what exactly do you think is going to happen? Like mm-hmm. God has you at this church and this church has, you know, your, your pastor is, is, is there to, 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 to preach the word to you. God's going to be speaking to you on Sunday. You're going to be in communion with these people. You're going to be worshiping him on Sunday. Like God knows what you need more than you know what you need. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, I like to say like, well, I, I don't feel safe with it. I mean, it, it's, just, it's just really a, a bizarre kind of kind of twisting of things. Like, well, I know better. I, I know that my church is not safe. And, and how do I know that? Well, they're all white there. Like that, that that's just Racist. a weird kind of, well, it is. I, I agree. I, you know, uh, I'll, I'll let you take the heat for that one. But, <laughs> but no, I, I do agree with that. And, um, you know, and, and the, the thing is that the funny part at the time, I, I I mean, I did not support Trump. I, I didn't vote at all. I didn't recommend anyone vote. Mm-hmm. Um, but but the, that whole thing, after he was elected, I, I just saw, like, so much derangement. <laughs> you know, totally, just, totally. I, what's going on here, you know? Yeah. Anyway, but, but, but uh, yeah, I, I agree with you very much that, that, you know, sometimes, you know, someone who hasn't experienced what you've experienced might be a good person to talk to. I, I mm-hmm. don't know, because... It'll help maybe help you think about things a different way. I don't know, but um, it's just sort of a selfish sort of not not selfish, maybe like a, just I don't know, maybe arrogant position. I, I'm not really sure what I'd call it, but it's just a weird position. It almost sounds to like have. somebody who doesn't want help. They want to stay in that sort victimhood, of. you know? Like, right? You can't help me, you know. I just want to be here. Just feel sorry for me and be guilty. I don't know. It just has that kind of tone. Yeah, it, it does. It definitely does, and, and I'm not sure really where that comes from because that's not really something that you'll find anywhere in the bible you know Mm -hmm. yeah so what would you recommend to if people are listening and maybe they feel like they're put in this situation where maybe their church is kind of really taking on this this the social justice warrior mantra but we want it we definitely don't want it to be something that's like i'm gonna leave the church now or anything like that but how how to um i guess discuss discuss it like what's a good starting point do you think Right. No, that, that's, that's a very good question because, um, you know, sometimes, and, and I don't want to criticize people that I don't, that I don't really know, but, but sometimes I'll get comments on my YouTube videos or even like just personal comments, you know, my inbox or something. And, um, people will say something like, well, you know, so, 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 and so is obviously a heretic, like someone I was criticizing, you know, and we got to just disassociate from him and, and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, and, I, and I don't believe that. I, I don't believe that any of the people that I've criticized directly, um, are unbelievers. I don't think right. that they're they have a bad intention or anything like that. I, I, I don't want anyone to think that that's what I believe because it's not. Yeah. But um, what I would do if if I was in a church that was kind of going down this road is, first of all, I would commit to being long suffering. Um, mm. And so right up front, I would say I'm going to put up with as much as I possibly can uh, before I even consider leaving a church. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's advice that I would give to, to almost anybody, you know, because uh, I actually, when I was early on in my Christian faith, I, I, I did leave a church too quickly, in my opinion, and I regret it. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, so anyway, that's the first thing I do. And then the second thing I do is just be very open and honest with my concerns and my questions and my understanding of Scripture and just ask questions to the people that are promoting yeah, I think this questions stuff. is huge. Yeah. Just ask yeah. questions and have them think through it because you know if they're generally looking for truth i think it'll come out if everyone just questions everything they're thinking yes. about then the truth will come you know mm-hmm. very much so that, that i agree and, and questions are are not really that threatening and, mm-hmm. and they'll get people talking and and the, the the bottom line though is that we we just have to have our bibles completely open and willing to go wherever we need to go to find out what's really true mm. and uh, we have to make sure that we're defining things biblically, that we're considering what the Bible says about things. Like it's 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 like the same thing with like with like the word love, right? We all 
love that word because it says God is love in the Bible, right? Uh, but we know that the world has kind of a skewed definition of what love is. And so we always go to our Bibles to define love, right? right. That's what we do. We we're just instinctively do that. Well, we got to do the same thing with, with justice. We have to do the same thing with justice mm. because the world can skew that word as well. And so mm-hmm. Bible's open, lots of humility, commit to being long suffering. <laughs> and that's, and that's really it. Um, I, I know that some people that are in the social justice movement are, are probably going to take it too far. Mm-hmm. Um, it's some of the people that I criticized on online and I mean, they were, they were saying some pretty harsh things about people who, who would not go with them on this and that can make it tough. And I don't really want to make a blanket sort of advice for people in without knowing the specifics, but right, right. I would, tr- I, I would try to put up with as much as I could, you know? Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. Any, any final thoughts on where people can find you, your YouTube, if you have a Twitter, all that good stuff. Yeah, definitely. So, um, you could, I mean, if you, if you look up, uh, A D Robles, R O B L E S, uh, you'll find me on YouTube. I don't know the actual address to the page, but A D Robles, I think I'm the only one out there. You are. Um, it's pretty easy to find you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And th- that's my name on Facebook as well. And then on Twitter, I, I just started using Twitter a couple weeks ago. And so, Okay. Uh, I'm AD Robles there as well, but the, the handle is Redeemed Rutland, uh, R-U-T-L-A-N-D. Okay. Um, but I would also, you you mentioned Daryl Harrison and the in the Just Thinking podcast. Yeah. I would also recommend that very, very much. I, you know, I, I tend to joke around a little bit on my stuff, but he's very serious, which I like. Mm-hmm. And and he's also, um, one thing that I've, I've been trying to emulate of him, and I'm, I'm not as successful as he is, but he's very focused on the Bible super yeah. focused yeah. on the Bible, yeah. which I love. And I'm trying to do that a little bit more. Um, but he actually just put out an article just like t- tonight that I I agree with all of it, but somehow I'm still convicted by it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's just, oh, yeah. it's awesome. just so good. Uh-huh. I uh, saw and, it. I think I just, like, literally before this interview when I was putting my baby to bed, I saw it and saved it for later. <laughs> I saw that very yeah, article. I'm like, yep, going to read that later. It's <laughs> great. It's really good. And so I would recommend him as well. Um, and you know, a lot of guys are talking about this now, which, which I'm very grateful for because this, this does need attention. It's not the only issue, uh, Mm -hmm. but it is an important one in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, definitely. I mean, like you said, since Trump was elected, it seemed to just blow up as far as like everything is about race and everything is about this intersectionality and everything is about all this social justice and it's like bombarding everywhere. And then it started creeping into the church and. That's what kind of got us concerned, and then we found you, and then et cetera. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, definitely. No, I'm, I'm glad you did, and I'm glad to, to be talking about this. Yeah, cool. we are too. Thank you so much. Well, one final thing. Um, two questions. One, your favorite movie, and then recommend a movie that maybe people haven't heard of or seen. <laughs> yeah, so, <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I can't pick one movie. I, I love the Star Wars movies okay. um, at, 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 as a whole. Uh, my favorite is uh, the probably just the original Star Wars. That, that's probably my favorite. Mm. Nice. So many good, so many good memories with that. And then um, let's see, a movie that people might not have seen. That's a good question. Um, maybe you know one, one movie I really like, and I'm not really sure why I like it, <laughs> but uh, it's called uh, uh, Lost in Translation, um, and it has uh, Bill Murray. And Scarlett Johansson before she was popular. Oh yeah, and, I heard about the movie. Yeah, actually, I actually haven't seen that one, but it is everywhere and like here and there, yeah. like little, almost like an indie film type feel. Yeah, it's like a, a weirdo indie film. Yeah, it, it's and it's it's like I don't really even know like how to describe what it's about, <laughs> but it's just it's just really good. I I'd recommend uh, people watch it. Um, awesome. Yeah, I think that's that's probably it. Cool. Well, that's great. Yeah, we we love movies, so it's kind of one of our favorite questions. We always have to to ask everybody but thank you so much and you were our first official special guest so we want to just give you a special mm-hmm. shout out we're really glad it was you and uh it was awesome talking to you and i i hope everyone go check out his videos yeah. and welcome to twitter by the way i waited forever as well but all, all this <laughs> stuff got me too <laughs> yeah well i used to do i used to tweet a lot and then i i deleted my account and i hadn't been on there for like five years or so maybe more <laughs> and um <laughs> and so, I'm sure it was like, whoa, what is all this stuff on here? Because it, it gets crazy on there. 
Man. Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's very true. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I had a great time. And, and honestly, if, if we ever want to chat again, I, I'd love to, even if it's not on, on the podcast, but uh, I'd love to. It, it, was, it was a great time. See what we tell you guys. He puts everything so much better than we can. <laughs> He's pretty great. Did you guys enjoy that? Hope you guys enjoy that. Definitely go check out his, his videos. And even though a lot of them are talking specifically to the MLK 50, a lot he a lot of cool points come out as he's talking about it. So even if you're not interested in the conference, um, you know, when you're talking about something specific and ideas come out, it's really mm-hmm. a lot of good wisdom in there, man. Lots of, lots of good wisdom nuggets. Wisdom nuggets. Wisdom nuggets, yeah. And uh, if you guys have any questions for him, um or us sent him our way and um he made it very clear that he'd like to come back or would be willing to come back anyway yeah so if you want to do a follow-up um responding to any of your guys's questions or responses to him that might be fun that'd be awesome we'd um, love to have him back and, and talk to, to you guys more. yeah um if you've been thinking about these issues if you're if you disagree with us that's fine too. Um, we would love to tackle them, or, or we'll give them to Adam to tackle. Yeah, so follow us on Twitter or contact us on Twitter. I'm at Natalite. <laughs> I love how you say that. And I'm at that Chris Cloud. I have to do it in my answering machine voice. Um, answering machine. <laughs> remember answering machines. Whatever. My voicemail voice. Voicemail. Kids. Um, answering machines were these things that used yeah, to... Tapes. Remember the little tapes? <laughs> I remember the little tapes. The little tapes were so cool. <laughs> there were little tapes, you guys. Uh-huh. It's a thing. And Ask your parents. And anyways. Yeah. So thank you so much for listening, guys. I hope this was informative and we sure had a good time with the interview and we'll see you guys next week. Okay, love you. Bye. Okay, love you. Bye. <laughs>